time here welcome if it's your millionth time here welcome it's great to see you uh, it's the summer obviously uh, a lot of our regular weekly activities and things like that are just dialed back a little bit um, there is no Sunday school today uh, but we do have some coloring packs and and some things like that out in the lounge area out there if the kids would like to go out there just be aware please the young children need to be supervised um, but uh, they're welcome to use that out there. That's great. And of course, all of our regular stuff, coffee morning, Bible study, house group, um, house groups, all of those other things, kitchen, toddler group, all of that stuff, youth and everything is all on pause just for uh, a few weeks until we get back into normal. It's, it's a strange time over summer, isn't it? It's strange. I mean, I'm looking around and I'm seeing all these empty chairs and I'm thinking it's great that people are enjoying their holidays and we're looking forward to our holiday, but, you know, doesn't it show a lack of commitment that they don't come home on the Sunday whilst they're away at holiday and things like that? But, uh, no, it's, it's great. It's a funny time of year, but uh, we just pray that everybody is incredibly blessed through that. And, of course, next Sunday, uh, sorry, next Saturday is our fun day. Uh, Brie and Riette have done an incredible job uh, so far in pulling everything together. And these ladies need a real round of applause because they're doing... They are... doing an incredible job. And uh, we're really, really looking forward to next Saturday. Uh, do, come, do come along and uh, get involved. Have a, have a great time. I just want to share a couple of verses with you. I read a, a quote yesterday that struck me. Let me share two verses with you. The first one is James 4, verse 7. It says, Submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Come near to God, and he will come near to you. I'm sure most of us are familiar with those words. And the second one is from Romans 12. Again, a, a fairly... Um, popular verse that I'm sure most of us are familiar with. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Submit yourselves to God. Don't conform to this world. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And here's the quote that I read yesterday. God can do more with your submission than you can do with your control. And I just want to issue that. As great as it is to have the sunshine, long may it last, probably be raining tomorrow, but there we go. <laughs> Let's stand together. And I wonder this morning, as we praise God and as we worship Him, can we submit to Him? Can we submit to his will? Can we give our will over to his? Can we let him be in control? Can we let him be in control of our lives? Can we let him be in control of our worship? Can we let him be in control of this service today? You know, we're not here. Really, I, I, I sometimes wonder about the word service. Why do we call it a service? Who are we serving? Who are we serving today? Father, today, as we stand here in your house, as we stand in your presence, Lord, would you have your way? Lord, 
that is my prayer today. Would you have your way in this place? Lord, would you let your Holy Spirit fall today onto willing hearts? Thank you, Jesus. Can we just allow our hearts to be open to what the Holy Spirit wants to do today? Thank you, Jesus. I was buried beneath my shame. Who could carry that kind of weight? It was my till I. Glory. 
glorious day.
Jesus. Lord, we know that you won't fail. Lord, we know that you won't fail. We know that you won't, um, you won't be brought low. Lord, no matter what the world says, no matter how the world mocks, we know that you won't be brought low. And Father, we glorify you today as the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And Lord, I'm reminded of that verse today that says, at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. Thank you, Jesus, for the reality of those words, for the truth of those words. I'm going to stay in an attitude of worship, but I just want to bring a, a response to you to what has been Plastered all over social media, I'm sure most of you would have seen the response, responses to the opening ceremony of the Olympic Games and the blatant mockery of the Lord's Supper, the blatant mockery of our faith, and the blatant mockery of our Savior. And at first, you know, I was probably filled as many of you would be with some anger, some hurt. And I've heard all sorts of questions banded about over the last couple of days. Would, what, what if they had mocked Islam in the same way? Well, they didn't. What if they had mocked the LGBT community in the same way? Well, they didn't. They mocked Jesus. And do you know what? That fills me with hope. It fills me with hope because Jesus said that this would happen. He said, remember that if the world hates you, it hated me first. Jesus was mocked when he was being persecuted by the Roman soldiers, when they tore out his beard from his face, and they pushed a crown of thorns onto his head. They put a robe of purple on his shoulders that was open wounds. And when he was nailed to the cross, they said, he saved others, can't he save himself? And they mocked him. And Paul wrote to a church in Rome, and he said, bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. So my response to that today is one of hope, is one of love. It's one of care for a lost, broken, and hurting world. What are we taught when people bully at school? Often it's because of their own insecurities. And I see a world that is insecure. And they need the security of a savior. They don't need our anger. They don't need our 
shaking fists. They don't need our political responses. They need to know that we still love because Jesus still loved. And I want to leave you with Jesus' response to those who mocked him on the cross. Father, forgive them. For they know not what they do. Let's pray. Father, today, we ask for forgiveness. We ask for forgiveness for our anger, for our wrong responses. And Lord, we ask that you help us to show the same humility that Jesus showed. Lord, we ask that you help us to be who you need us to be to be who you called us to be, to show love, care, connection, compassion, and forgiveness. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Just take a couple of moments, turn to somebody next to you or behind you or in front of you and say hello and welcome them today. Okay. Well, that was good. Whew. Let's stand. Thanks, James.
up to the cross is my failure is lost in the light of your glorious grace so let the ruins come to life in the beauty of your name rising up from the ashes God forever you reign and my soul find refuge in the shadow of your wings I will love you forever and forever I'll sing
is a light that the shadows can't deny. Your name cannot be overcome. Your name is a light forever lifted high. Your name cannot be overcome. Your name is a light that the shadows can't deny. Please take your seats. How are we all doing today? All right? Yes? One is, one is well? Yes? Bless you guys. I'll, I'll speak up so I don't have to be too loud. Um, how was your week? I've had one of those eclectic weeks. Do you ever have weeks where you, you think, so that happened? No. Yeah, um, I've had one of those. Um, in, in weird ways, um, so, and some of it I can't actually talk about, which is really weird, because I'd love to share some of it with you guys. Um, but it's amazing, it's amazing the opportunities you sometimes get to live out your faith. And by that I mean in, in the sense of believing that the things that you're doing or you're up to are in some ways an act of worship at the same time as the activity itself or the things you do. And um, for those of you who don't know me, I, I, I've been a churchgoer since before I was born. Um, so been around a while now. I'm 48, so I know that's spring chicken. So yeah, yeah, still believe that as well, and um, will do and continue to. Do. Um, yeah, I think I'm a, I'm a young person until I die. I think is the you never get old, do you, in your head? Um, so anyway, we're rambling away, um, and. Um, for most of you that know me, you know that um, growing up as a pastor's kid, growing up in churches, you um, get used to the used to. There's the familiarity. But within that frame is the hunger and the search for the authenticity of Christ in the midst of all of it. And the longer that you, you live and, and are part of church congregation, the more that you get hungry for something more than just a pattern but you get hungry for a person and in that comes thousands of questions and so it was funny as my wife and I were joking the other day when when you're young like you know when you're 14 15 you've got and you've grown up in church you, you've, you've got it all sorted you kind of know that everything right I've I've done the prayer of confession. I've read the Roman road. I've got baptismal waters sorted out. I've done some prayer meetings, done a bit of evangelism, heard many sermons. I mean, by the time you're 14 and you've heard one sermon for 52 times a year, um, then you, 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 you kind of get familiar with the gospel narrative. You know, you know it's not just about being a good boy so that you get to go to heaven, but you know, you're saved by the grace of God and the goodness of God. And his, his saving sacrifice. And so that, all the boxes are ticked. So then really it becomes about cracking on with life. Because when you die, you go into heaven. 
And so, um, so at 14, you kind of got it sorted. And then you go through this interesting phase, um, which is the next 30-something years of your life until you get to where I am right now. And some of you are well past me. So you, you've got far more learning under your belt, and you know, you know even less than I think I know now in that sense of you know less the more you know, right? Um, and, so, um, and so you get to the point where you're like, I, there are so many bits of life experience that have torn shreds in your certainty that you're left with, with a refined nugget of gold, which is the centrality of Jesus in the midst of it all. And how without him, you have nothing. And I'm reflecting on this week and for me, growing up, I, I'm left with questions of how do I worship when the piano stops? How do I worship when the song, The Power and the Blood, has its final chord, right? You know, and the, the, the thigh slapping stops, you know. Well, we, we've all done that, right? Um, how do we worship on Monday afternoon? And it's more than just put the radio on or put the Spotify on or put the tunes on and sing more songs. It's how do I worship when the music has stopped? And there's that great song that Matt Redman wrote in the midst of you know, a crisis that he was experiencing at the time when the music fades and all is stripped away and I simply come longing just to bring more than a song back to the heart of worship when it's all about you, Jesus. And, and I am reflecting on this week. And there's going to be some, some moments in this week for me where I I've, I've thought, you know, that was, I couldn't have sung that. <laughs> that was good. And it's humbling to be part of things where God puts you in situations where you have an opportunity to make a profound difference. And you end up speaking to people you never imagined you'd speak to. And you end up <laughs> planning a sermon. <laughs> And, and thinking you'd rather share everything about the goodness of God from those moments, and yeah, I can't talk about them. And the reason I can't talk about them is because the people I was talking to, it's not the sort of thing you do from platforms. Um, and so, so that happened this week. But that said, what I can say, and this is me trying to help others, um, if you have spare crutches, walking sticks, or walking aids sitting in your garages, you wouldn't awfully mind dropping them off at the Bayside Fitness Club in Poole, would you? Because working together with the Jordanian royal family, we're going to get them into Gaza. Because there's 10,000 amputees, half of them are children. And many of them can't even mobilize themselves to get to the toilets from their tents because they're amputees. And I'm watching even the news this morning with the bombs flying over between nations in the Middle East. And my words to one person this week were, nobody wins in war. And it is humans who suffer. And we need to come to a resolution in our minds of the supremacy of Christ or not. It reminded me as I was reading some of the news this morning, and this is none of my prep, but I will get onto it, I promise, of the, the moment, and I've said this before, but some of you are new here, so you won't have heard this story, so you're getting this one. There's a story of Billy Graham visiting Berlin about 10 years after World War II. Berlin is still being rebuilt. It's split in half, there's the wall. And Billy Graham is with the Chancellor of Germany, Conrad Adenauer, at the time. And the, Conrad Adenauer is looking over the, the city of Berlin. There was not a rooftop left after that building. That city had been sacked after World War II. And Conrad Adenauer turned around to Billy Graham and says, do you believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ? And Billy Graham turned around and said, of course I believe. I would have no gospel to preach if I didn't believe in that. And Conrad Adenauer, looking over this city, said, outside of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, I know of no other hope for mankind. And we reflect on the world today, on the finances of the United Kingdom, 
on the wars that we see in Ukraine, over the conflicts that we see in parts of the Middle East, over some of the conflicts that we're seeing begin to brew over in parts of Asia, and the uncertainty of the world. And I reflect on the character and substance of some of the individuals we looked after in hospitals who were the, the last generation that survived and lived through World War II. And the, the steel in them through the forging of that time and their determination and their faith. And I think our message of a, of a loving God who emptied himself and gave himself for the good of others, of a God who has dealt with the brokenness and sinfulness of mankind once and for all through his sacrifice and blood, and the promise of resurrection that transcends this life. I know of no other hope for mankind. And the invitation to live in that hope from now unto eternity. The invitation not to treat the life of Christ as an opportunity to sit in the waiting room of life until we die, so that we get to go to heaven when we die. As often I've called it the fire insurance view of, of, the, of Christianity. But the opportunity to step into his glorious, majestic life and to live that out in the world in which we live. With all that it means, with all that it requires, with all of the sacrifice of letting go, the perspective shift, the, what, what matters most, you know, getting offended by what people do on a, on a blinking Olympics opening ceremony, because they really didn't know what they were doing. Or whether we view it as the tragedy of mankind that is so blinded and lost because it doesn't really know the beauty and majesty of what was going on in that moment. And if they only knew. And how will they know if all we do is focus on buildings and services? rather than crutches and hearts. Does that make sense? So that's my week. There's been other stuff. But that happened. Let's turn to Philippians 3. We're going to go from part the way through verse 14. I'm just going to borrow the last bit of Mark's sermon, if that's all right. He kind of didn't cover this bit, so I feel like I'm justified in using the last bit. So Mark, did I press on towards the goal? So I'm going to do for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Let us therefore, as many of who are perfect, have this attitude, that if in anything you have a different attitude, God will reveal also to you. However, let's, let us keep living by the same standard by which we have attained. Brethren, join in following my example and observe those who walk according to the pattern that you have in us. For many walk of whom I have told you, and now tell you even with tears, that they are enemies of the cross of Christ. Those whose end is destruction, whose God is their appetite, whose glory is in their shame, who set their minds on earthly things. For our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly wait for our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform the body of our humble state into the conformity with his glory, his body, by the exertion of the power that he has even subjected all things to himself. Philippians 3, verse 14, written by Paul. Paul, as I've outlined before, the persecutor of the Christians that became a promoter of Christianity, because of an encounter on his way to Damascus where he had authority to arrest Christians and drag them bound back to Jerusalem for trial. And he had an encounter with the risen Jesus. You know the story of him being blinded, going meet, meeting and then getting in healed again and then crack, cracking on. This Paul, 30 years later, is penning these words. Roughly 30 years, about 29, 30 years, something like that. It's written two years before the fall of Rome. And... Um, 
where Rome was burned, and then they started to put the, the Christians into the Colosseum. And so, so this Paul writes, the upward call of God in Christ. That the call is not crossways. That the call is not downward. The call is upward. That um, our central focus as Christians is not a call of looking around and comparing ourselves to one another. It's not a call of feeling like, well, at least I'm better than them over there. It's not a call of, at least my life isn't messed up like their life is messed up. I could read you the parable that Jesus tells of the publican and the Pharisee, which is the prayer kind of thing, where the Pharisee prays and says, at least I'm not sinful like that guy over there. And Jesus asks the question, whose prayer do you think he listened to? And so with, with us, this call, this upward call of God in Christ, what is the upward call of God in Christ? What is it? If this is the central message that Paul is getting at in these few verses, if this is what it means to press on towards, if it, what, what is all this about? This is all about the upward call of God in Christ. So what is, what, what, where is, where are you heading? Let me ask you the question, where are you heading? Well, I, you know, let's, let's, let's take the Olympics, for example. The Olympics. So some people are heading towards the prize of the gold medal. And some have spent 8, 12 years refining their body, practicing day in, day out, working to one primary objective, and the transformation of their life, their lifestyle, the food that they eat, the, the equipment that they use, the physical body that they have, whether it be powerlifting, which has one particular look, um, Mark, or whether it, be, um, whether it be some sort of majestic crossfit kind of objective, which is my physique, Probably more chef look going for here. Or, or, or others, whatever it may be, they've spent years honing themselves to get that prize. And what the tragic thing is when they come in fourth, right? Worst place you could ever finish in the Olympics is fourth. Because you don't even get a bit of the Eiffel Tower, right? You, you don't even get your medal. Yeah, you, you're just short. But that, that's the, the, the call. For those of you, you might have like an objective you want to achieve in your life, like something that's the call. It's the, the, the epitome. Oscar Wilde said, the best thing that can happen to a man is you can get your dreams. The worst thing that can happen to, your man, to a man is you get your dreams. Because what you've got to live for now. Somebody else once said, I can't remember who it is, forgive me. Somebody Google it, you can shout it out. That the, the worst thing that can happen, the, big, the ultimate point of meaningless is not when somebody becomes weary of pain, it's when they become weary of pleasure. This is Paul setting out the one goal. The upward call of God in Christ. What is the upward call? Paul hints to it in these verses. We get it in the last verse, in verse 21. Hints at it. That the ultimate goal is resurrection. Chesterton. The upward call of God in Christ. The ultimate goal is the resurrection. Not his resurrection. Although it is that. It is also your resurrection. We sit here and we, we see people we know and love. Go. We see tragedy in parts of the world. We see brokenness and emptiness. On the way to this city, there would have been crucified bodies on the entrance to the city. Rome in power. Family members walking past cousins on the way into the city. The upward call of God in Christ. Paul's saying, set your eyes 
on the upward call, the goal, the final destination. When you set out from the port and you're trying to get on your holiday in the Algarve or wherever you're going, right? And, and you're, you're trying, to, trying to get your holiday. That's your final destination. Set your eyes on the destination. Endure the journey for the upward call of God in Christ. And this upward call is something that Paul was hinting to when he started to talk about the resurrection. I'm going to read a few more verses, if that's all right with you. And I'm going to jot around to a number of them. So I'm just going to go to the end of my notes before I actually then preach the rest of them. If you go to 1 Corinthians 15 for me for a minute. Forty two to forty nine. Paul writing to the church in Corinth. So also is the resurrection of the dead. It is sown in a perishable body, it is raised in an imperishable body. It is sown in dishonor, it is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness, it is raised in power. It is sown in a natural body, it is raised in a spiritual body. If there is a natural, there is also a spiritual. So also it is written, first man, Adam, became a living soul. The last Adam became a living spirit. We went forward a little bit and we go to chapter 16. I'm just going to look at, at, no, we're going to skip that. I'm going to move to Romans 8 because I want to be reasonably quick today. So go to Romans 8 verse 11. Sticky fingers. I'll read from verse 9, but sticker is, is verse 11. However, you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. But if anybody does not have the Spirit of Christ, he, is not, he does not belong to him. If Christ is in you, though the body is dead because of sin, yet the Spirit is alive because of righteousness. But if the Spirit of him who raised Christ from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Jesus Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his Spirit who dwells in you. Paul and John and James and Peter and Matthew and Thomas and all of these folks you see through, through followers of Jesus all saw something when they saw the risen Christ. They saw something that was other. They found it hard to recognize him, but then they recognized him by his behavior and his attitudes, and then suddenly their eyes were opened. This is Jesus. And yet, what's fascinating is they all started to write about this resurrected body. We want to be like him in his resurrection. We want to endure the sufferings so that we may obtain what he is in his resurrected form. Able to sit, eat, and make breakfast at a, at, a, at a beachside. Able to walk through walls. Able to appear and disappear. This Jesus who was raised in an imperishable body. That is what we want to attain. And they all preached it. The very epicenter of the Christian faith is the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Christ, all of them went to their deaths with joy because they knew what they were going to inherit. They lived their entire lives with a sense of determination and purpose, self-giving, loving others for the sake of others, for their souls, for their... Paul, I am being poured out upon the sacrifice and service of your faith. It is better that I would be with him, but I will be with you because it is good until he takes me. It's got this idea that they are so impressed, so enamored, so eyes opened, transformed by the resurrected Jesus Christ that they wanted nothing else in this world. It is not simply the statement from from Billy Graham, outside of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, I know of another hope for mankind. But actually, the greatest hope for mankind, the greatest hope for you in your life, is to possess the resurrected form of Jesus Christ. That you will be utterly imperishable, My knees are giving out a bit. This one's properly dodgy at the moment. I kicked a football around with some of the folks that we're housing in the YMCA. And I knew I shouldn't, but I wanted to join in. And the right knee's usually the dodgy one. But this one's properly giving me jip now. And I may have to go and get it sorted out, but I'm male, and so it's the thing we put off, right? It's perishable. Imperishable. 
untarnishable, unstainable, unplottable, unharmable, unkillable, undefilable, perfect. One day we will put on the imperishable. Paul is saying that the promise in Christ, the upward call of God in Christ, is that that possession will be yours. Now let's go back to some of these verses. And I'm just going to read them bit by bit and take my time through some of them. And then I'm going to land the plane because it's a hot day, isn't it? Go back to 14. The upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Let us, therefore, as many who are perfect, have this attitude... And if anything, you have a different attitude, God will reveal it to you. In other words, if you think you're living for something else, God will show you. Let us keep living by the same standard which we have attained. Brethren, join in following my example and observe those who walk according to the pattern you have in us. What Paul is saying in these few verses is that your Christian life is not about being good, although you will be good. Your Christian life is not about demonstrating the good that you you are, being better than other people. Your Christian life is not about lording it over people like you're somehow, you're smarter than them because you believe the right thing and they believe the wrong thing. All of these things are important. Belief is important. Being good is important. All of these things are important. But Paul is basically saying, that's not the center point. In fact, he describes it slightly earlier in those verses that Mark's were preaching on, that those people are the ones that focus on the flesh. Their God is their stomach, their appetite, their glory, that they kind of lord it over people. That's, that's what Paul is, he says, don't, don't focus on, in fact, he says, we lay, out, we lay aside these things and press on towards the upward call of God in Christ. We, our focus is not on being wiser Christians, although being wise is good. Our focus is not on being theologically more accurate, although being theologically accurate is good. Our focus is not on being a better preacher, although preaching isn't necessarily bad. Francis of Assisi said it one way. He said, he said, everywhere I go, I preach the gospel. Sometimes I use words. And where I'm going to just segue into it is, yes, you need to use words. But what he was saying was, follow my example. In other words, he's saying, this is all great. And study your Bibles, pray, come to church, join together with people, sing songs, do all of those things. But never let those be the priority of your Christian life and, and framework for what it is to be a good person. Because frankly, coming along here on a Sunday morning, chucking money in an offering, and hearing somebody encourage you so you can go and leak like a bucket and come back dragging your heels and the rest of the, into, and I need a refresh for somebody to convince me God's real again, just so I can last another. That isn't the sum total of the Christian life. But the Christian life is one where we gather together to encourage one another, that we inspire one another with our stories and our songs and our worship, and then we all go en masse because the church is on mission to reach this world with the loving arms of Jesus in whatever context we find ourselves in. Whether it be cleaning, whether it be nursing, whether it be doctoring, whether it be lawyering, or whatever other the yings are. You can do it in a prison service. You can do it um, being a lifeguard on a beach. You can, do you see how this transformation of, of resurrection life leads to an outlived theology rather than a life of theology. And how what Paul is saying is, mimic us. If you read Jesus' words in Matthew 23 when he talks to the Pharisees, he talks about how they lord it over people as they know all the right things to say and do. And they, they know all the right, they, they tithe down to cumin. They go to, literally to the spice rack and say, here you are, Mark, there's a tenth of me, of me, me. Coleman's mustard and <laughs> but he, he says in, 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 Mark, in Matthew 23 he says but you neglect justice and mercy you neglect the orphan you neglect the soul that needs a, a, a loving heart 
You neglect the time for somebody that's broken. And it's, it's not saying we saw that suddenly all have to, like the rich young ruler, give all we have to the poor and go and follow Jesus as if that's now the answer. Because we can come, come just as much a Pharisee in that. Well, I give more than you. I've sacrificed more than you. And that's not what it's about either. Our eyes are not on the flesh. Paul was calls those the cutters of the flesh. And somehow all we do in our Christian walk is the more sacrifices that make we make, the better a Christian we are. Paul is saying, follow us. Follow our example. Live a life worthy of the gospel of Jesus Christ. He links it. This chapter is not separate from chapter 2. It's linked to chapter 2. Jesus, who though he existed in the form of God, did not consider equality to God something to be grasped, but emptied himself. Paul in this chapter is saying, although I exist as a citizen of heaven with a body of glory as my destiny, I do not consider it something that is my right and privilege and something that belongs to me. But I press on towards the prize, the upward call of God in Christ. He's basically saying, let's mimic Jesus. And as I mimic Jesus, you mimic me. So now we have to mimic Jesus, who carried his cross up a hill to give his life for those who were his enemies. Who walked through um, mockery and circumstances to stop for the one that would hear. Who sat down on a hillside and gave what he had. And the call for us as Christians is not to just make this our focus. This is great. I've been doing this for 48 years. You know, I come, I sing the songs. It's great. It's fabulous. Don't let me put that down. It's needed because what else would we have if we didn't have it, right? But don't make this the sum total of your Christian worship. In fact, if anything, make this the kickstart and let the engine that's roaring and drives be the sum total of your Christian worship. Mimic Christ because, as Chesterton said, it's not the bits of the Bible I don't understand that I find hard. It's the bits I do. Love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. If anybody asks for your shirt, give them your coat also. If they ask you to go one mile, go two. Take the the log out your own eye before you take the speck out of your brothers. These things that Jesus calls us to are a transcendent, other, resurrected life. Not something that is my belonging, like my inheritance. Look what I get to do when I die, and you heathens over there don't. But not assuming that's something that's my possession and going and embodying what Jesus would do. That is the Christian life. The faith in the God who is able, that it's not a right that I have it, it is a gift from him. I'm not going to assume I possess it, even though the truth is I do. I'm going to live as if it's not my right. I'm going to live as if it's a gift, and I will learn to allow that to transform who I am into someone that gives. There's 30,000 verses. I've not preached any of them. I do apologize. I got passionate about the things I'm normally passionate about. Let me ask you a question. And it's the same question I ask myself. How have I lived this week where my attitude and framework is not one of that heavenly mindset? How often this week have I lived as a citizen of this earth rather than a citizen of heaven? How often this week has my attitude been on me rather than my attitude been on that of Christ and those he loves? How often this week has my belief in the power and authority of God been less than it truly is? where he is sovereign over all things and he is able. Since when was he ever anything other than the lion? So often we treat our God like a kitten. I'll leave you with one thought and then we'll pray. The band can do what the band do. I read it in those verses in in Romans 8. 
Paul writes it in Philippians 3, the last verses. He will transform the body of a humble state into that which conforms with his glory. When you give your life to Jesus, the Holy Spirit comes and makes his dwelling within you. That is what the scriptures say. That Spirit of God is not a little dove or a small thimble of water. It is not even a mighty river or a fire that consumes all things. It is the very resurrecting power of God who will give life to your mortal bodies and render you imperishable. And he is in you now. Not when you die, now. That power that raised Christ from the dead lives in you. Now. It's not going anywhere. He's hooked in because you're, you're a temple of the Holy Spirit. And that power will see you to eternity. No doubt. No ifs, buts, maybes. You have it. But it's not just a, a possession which we demand as our right, but it's some life we get to live. We get to live in that assurance and that certainty and that power, the same power that raised Christ from the dead lives in you. And Paul is saying, let that be the call the upward call of God in Christ, that we are inheritors of the great possession. Take hold of that for which Christ has taken hold of me. And now what is this life that we live? But one which is a consummate gift of God, a gift to us and a gift to others. I no longer have to live to serve my own appetites. I no longer have to live to serve my own reputation. I no longer have to live to make sure I appear on various media channels. But I get to live a full life in the knowledge that Christ has already bought me, that I am already on the journey to take on the imperishable. And I get to live a full life where hope cannot be disappointed, where no matter what darkness appears in the earth, no matter what wars come, what can evil do to me now? What are you going to do? Crucify me? The joy of the sufferings is in the possession of the resurrected life. So press on towards the prize, the upward call of God in Christ. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for your goodness to us and your love to us and the ultimate prize of the imperishable. Lord, let us lay hold of you as you have laid hold of us. Lord, wrestle us to the ground and cause us to walk like you walk cause us to, to stumble where we should and cause us to rise where we should. Cause us, Lord, to give and live a life of love and light to this world. Cause us to challenge injustice. Cause us to live mercy. And cause us to be your people, your light, your salt in this earth. Help us, Lord, to throw the doors open and live boldness in our faith. Help us not to be intimidated or put off by the silliness of men's hearts who out of their ignorance sometimes beat you, insult you, pull your beard out, or even crucify you. Because, Lord, you rose again. Cause us to live that too. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Gareth. We're going to uh, worship. We're going to sing. And just remember, and we, we will say it from this platform, this, this is worship, but so is Monday morning. So is, so is Tuesday afternoon. Whatever you're doing this week, live your life in worship. And 
As we sing this song, let's stand together as we sing this last song today to close our service. The offering baskets are here if you've brought your, your uh, spices with you. You're welcome. But please feel under no obligation. And uh, we'll just leave the baskets here. And uh, do feel free to place your offering there. Thanks, James. Yes, Lord, we do worship you today. Lord, not just here on a Sunday, but with our whole hearts and our whole lives, Lord. Would you teach us to live out our worship, to live out our worship in love and compassion in this world, Lord. Thank you, God, for everything that you've poured into our lives. Help us to pour it out. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Just take your seats for a moment. I just wonder, Riet and Bree, do we... Do you want to both just come up for a moment? Is, is that okay? Um, are you having a moment, Riet? <laughs> I hope it's not because the fun day's coming up. <laughs> is there anything we need to know about? So I'm going to give this to Bree. Have your moment, Riet. Um, hi, everyone. So um, 
the Community Fund Day is upon us, and thank you for all your donations. Um, I am aware that a lot, um, some people still have donations to bring. Uh, the cutoff point is tomorrow at 7 p.m. Uh, I will be here for 7 p.m. just to sort out the last of the donations. And anyone who is still willing to help on the day, um, I'll be here from 9 o'clock. Uh, if you aim to arrive, maybe 10, 10.30, people who want to help, just help set up. And any cake bakers amongst us, please can you see uh, Celia or Heather, uh, as we still need uh, donations on cakes for the day. And we're a bit short on toys, fluffy toys, any kind of toys. Um, so if anybody still has toys to give. Uh, yes, and men's clothes as well. Um, so ladies, if you can sort of um, go through his wardrobe. <laughs> <laughs> Anything you want to get rid of, uh, please bring it to us. But yeah, we uh, please still pray for the weather and for a good turnout. We're very excited. Um, yeah, that's about it. For now. Brilliant. <laughs> Thank you, Brie. Riet, anything to add? No? <laughs> <laughs> Let's just pray for these ladies, can we? church. Father, today we thank you for Riet. We thank you for Bree. Lord, we thank you for the, all of the incredible hard work that they've put in in organizing this. Lord, we thank you for everybody who's helping on the day, everybody who has contributed. And Lord God, we pray your favor upon this day, Lord. Would it be an, an incredible opportunity, not just to raise money and awareness of, of missions, but also, Lord, to share your gospel in this community, Father. Lord, we pray for bridges. We pray for relationships. We pray for um, just opportunities. Lord, not, not to foist the gospel on people, but to be the gospel in people's lives, Lord. We pray that today in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Give these two a round of applause, would you, because they're both brilliant. And uh, do, do we need any more volunteers for anything? Do, okay, set up and whatever. What time will you be here on Saturday? Did you? Sorry. <laughs> okay. I'm going to sit down. Go home.